Hey everybody, this is Kevin, and in this week's video, we're going to try something a little bit different. Specifically, I want you to get actively involved in troubleshooting an OSPF topology. Now, how do we do that? Well, do you remember last week's video? I showed you how to get free access to Cisco Modeling Labs or CML out in the Cisco DevNet Sandbox. Or maybe like me, you've got your own copy of CML running on your machine. However you get to CML, it doesn't matter. What I have for you in this video, in the description specifically, I've got a zip file. And I want you to download that zip file and extract it. Inside, you'll find an ospftroubleshooting.yaml file. That file can be imported into your copy of CML, or the CML that you're using for free out at the Cisco DevNet Sandbox. And we're going to show you a video from our Anarsi course, where we're doing some OSPF troubleshooting. And you're going to see a topology, and it's not working. None of the routers have formed OSPF adjacencies, we haven't learned any routes, and your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to fix it, where every router has full reachability across the network. And you're going to pause the video, do it on your own, resume the video, and then I'll walk you through the complete solution where we troubleshoot everything and we get everything working perfectly. Now, let's go out to Cisco Modeling Labs just for a moment and let me remind you how you can import this file. We talked about this a bit in our video last week, and I'll leave a link for that up in the corner of this video if you missed it. But in Cisco Modeling Labs, you're going to go to Import Lab, and you'll say Browse, and you'll be browsing your local machine. And after you extract that zip file that I told you about, again, the link is in the description of this video, you're going to find this ospftroubleshooting.yaml file. So we'll import that, and we'll say Upload Topology, and then we'll go to Lab. And here is that topology. So you'll just go to Simulate, you'll start the lab, and when it boots up, it's going to have configurations in place. And each router has an OSPF configuration, but there are issues. Nobody is forming neighborships. And I'll show you the topology in this upcoming video that we're going to attach. And you're going to go out and fix it on your own. And if you enjoy this, please let me know. It's the first time we've tried something like this where you're getting actively involved. If you enjoy it, please leave a comment down below. And as always, please do me a favor, and if you enjoyed the video, click like and subscribe so you don't miss any of our weekly content. Now let's go check out this OSPF troubleshooting lab from our Anarsi course. Good luck. In this lab, you're going to be troubleshooting an OSPF topology. We've got three routers. We've got a couple of areas. You see that router R2, that's our ABR. And currently, none of our routers are learning any OSPF routes. So your challenge is to visit each of these routers, take a look at the existing OSPF configuration, and make any corrections necessary so that each router has full visibility to all the different networks. And at this point, you might want to pause the video. And if you've not already done so, you want to upload the YAML file for OSPF troubleshooting into your copy of Cisco Modeling Labs or into Cisco Modeling Labs available on the Cisco DevNet Sandbox. Once you get that up and going, then you can go to each of these three routers and troubleshoot the configuration. Then you can resume the video and we'll walk through the solution together. Let's take a look at the configuration for each of our routers. Let's verify, first of all, that we don't have any knowledge of routes learned via OSPF. I'll do a show IP route. And it looks like we've not learned anything from any routing protocol. Let's do a show IP protocols command. Let's verify that OSPF is indeed configured. Yes, indeed, we've got OSPF process ID 1. Let's take a look at our running configuration. In fact, let's just zoom down to the OSPF area. Here we see that gigabit 0 slash 1 is a passive interface. Is that okay? Yes. If you take a look at the topology gigabit 0 slash 1, it points out to switch SW1. There's no need to send OSPF messages out of that interface or receive OSPF messages on that interface because there are no OSPF neighbors off of that interface. We've only got one network statement. Is that a problem? Not necessarily. This one network statement is causing a gigabit 0 slash 1 to participate in this OSPF routing process. But if we take a look at the other interface, we've gone directly into that interface and said, hey, we want you to participate in OSPF process ID 1 as a member of area 0. 
So it looks like both interfaces are participating. And if we jump over to router R2 and do a show IP protocols command, something you might have noticed is that instead of saying OSPF1, here it says OSPF2. Is that a problem? No, unlike EIGRP, this is not an autonomous system number. This is a locally significant process ID. They do not have to match between routers. So that is okay. And something you might have noticed on R3, if we do a show run pipe to section router OSPF, you might have noticed that we had this network statement that didn't really seem to specify a specific network connected to R3, but remember what the network statement is doing. The network statement is saying, here is an IP address space. And any interface whose IP address lives in that address space, we want that interface to participate in OSPF. And what that means is we want to advertise that interface's network, along with that interface's subnet mask. So here we've got a network statement that encompasses all possible IP version 4 addresses. So yes, both of our interfaces have IP addresses that fall within this address space of all possible addresses, and that's going to cause both interfaces to participate. Those are some things you might have noticed. Now let's see what is not correct about this configuration. In fact, right here, I think we see a problem area. If we look at the topology, we see that we do indeed have an opportunity to have a passive interface, but it would be off of gigabit 0 slash 2 on R3. It looks like this has been mistyped. We have a passive interface off of gigabit 0 slash 1. That's going to prevent a neighborship from forming between R2 and R3. Let's fix that. Let's go into router configuration mode for OSPF process ID 1, and I'm going to negate this passive interface command and let's put in a different passive interface command. I'll say passive hyphen interface gigabit 0 slash 2 and we might have an adjacency come up with router R2 unless something else is going on which is totally possible. In fact let's take a close look at the entire configuration and make sure nothing looks suspicious. We've got interface gigabit 0 slash 1. All that looks good. Gigabit 0 slash 2, all that looks good. Our passive interface is Gigabit 0 slash 2. That's looking good as well. Let's go over to router R2. In fact, let's see if we're in the process of forming a neighborship. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor command. Nope, no neighbor yet. Can I see my neighbor? Let's try that. Show CDP neighbor. I see both neighbors, so I've got physical visibility or physical connectivity to those neighbors. So that's good. What else might be going on? Well, let's take a look at our interfaces. Let's do a show IP OSPF interface gigabit 0 slash 1. And we see its network type. We see its timers. Anything suspicious here? I think there is. I think the default timer for a broadcast network type is 10 seconds. I think we're set to a non-default value here. Oh, and also notice that we're a member of area 0 here. And if we look at gigabit 0 slash 2, we're a member of Area 1. Ah, so if we look at our topology, we see that R3's interfaces should be a member of Area 1. I think they were set to Area 0. I think that's another issue. So let's fix both of those issues. We've got a timer issue, and we've got a mismatched area issue. First, let's go back to R3. And sure enough, look at this. I'm saying that that network statement is putting interfaces in area 0. While the 0, .0, 0.0.0.0, while that's fine, the area is wrong. So let's get rid of that. I'll say router OSPF1, and I'll negate that network statement. Let's do a copy-paste, and let's put it in specifying area 1. Network 0.0.0.0, .0 with a wildcard mask of all 255s. This time, we'll say area 1, and hopefully we'll have an adjacency come up. And while we're waiting on that to happen, let's go over to router R2 and fix that timer issue on that interface pointing over to R1. Let's go back to R2. Let's just confirm that we do have a non-default timer configured. And we do. It says IP OSPF hello interval 20. Let's set that back to the default, which is 10 seconds. And if I'm unsure of the default, I could say default IP OSPF hello interval, and that should put it back to 10 seconds. Let's see if it did. 
let's do a show IP OSPF interface gigabit 0 slash 1. And when we put it back to the default, it did indeed go back to 10 seconds. Let's see if we're trying to form any neighborships now. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor command. It looks like we're working on it. it looks like we have formed a neighborship with R3. And it looks like we're working on one with R1. Let's do a show IP route. Have I learned anything? Yes, I have learned about the 172.16.1.0 network. That's the network hanging off of R3 going over to switch SW2. So we've resolved that issue. But it seems like we still don't have a connection with R1. And notice the state that we seem to be stuck in is this X start state. Oftentimes, when you see that X start state, let's see if we still have that. We do. We're not transitioning through it. We're kind of stuck there. Eventually, it'll probably time out and just say we're down. But if we're stuck in that X start state, that often indicates an MTU mismatch. So let's check out our MTU configuration. For gigabit 0 slash 1, I can say show IP interface gigabit 0 slash 1. That'll tell me the MTU. It says the MTU is the default of 1500 bytes. What about R1? What about the other end of this link? Let's go to R1 and we'll do a show IP interface gigabit 0 slash 2. And it has, oh look at this, it has a non-default MTU. And we got a hint that this is what might be going on by having our neighborship stuck for a period of time in that X start state. So let's take a look at our config and what caused this. Let's do a show run. Let's take a look at gigabit 0 slash 2. Yeah, it looks like we've set a non-default MTU, so let's fix that. Let's go into interface gigabit 0 slash 2. And I could either say IP MTU 1500, or I could say default IP MTU. Either one would work. So let's set this back to the appropriate MTU value and see if we have an adjacency come up here in a moment. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor. And it looks like we have a neighborship. That is great news. In fact, let's go back over to R2 and make sure it knows about two neighbors. Let's do a show IP OSPF neighbor command. Ah, great news. We do have two neighbors. This is R1, this is R3, and we have fully established an adjacency. So let's go back to where we started. Let's go back to R1 and make sure that I have full visibility throughout the network. I should have learned about two routes via OSPF. I should have learned about the 203.0.113.0/30 network between R2 and R3, and I should have learned about the 172.16.1.0/24 network off of R3 going over to SW2. Let's confirm that. Let's do a show IP route. Great news, we have indeed learned about those two networks. And we see the IA code that indicates that they live in a different area. That's because we're currently in area zero, while those two networks, they live in area one. Now let's sum up some of the issues that we ran into. One thing is we specified an incorrect area. So if you have a multi-area network, we need to be really careful that we're specifying the appropriate area as part of the network command, or as part of the IPOSPF command in interface configuration mode. We also had a non-default timer, and we have to have matching timers with OSPF. We had a passive interface applied to an incorrect interface. We had it applied to an interface off of which we did want to establish a neighborship. And finally, we had a mismatched MTU, and we were stuck in that X start state in our neighbor formation for a period of time. And oftentimes, that does indicate an MTU mismatch. And that's a look at a troubleshooting scenario for OSPF. Mm -hmm.